A warm welcome to everyone. My name is Patricia Rink, and I'm one of the research group leaders at Keta Hamburger Colleague Center for Global Cooperation Research here in Duisburg. On behalf of the two co-organizing co institutes, the Center for Global Cooperation Research and the Institute for Development and Peace, INEF, Cornelia Ulbert and I would like to welcome you to our Keta Hamburger Dialogue on the war in Ukraine. We are very grateful that our four speakers, David Kamen, Oksana Hus, Tamara Matzenyuk, and Siddharth Repati, as well as our moderator, Andreas Zumach, accepted our invitation, and we are very happy that you have all joined our webinar. I'm sure everybody is following the news and is up to date as to what's happening in Ukraine, so I don't need to say much about this, but I would like to give you a brief overview of what we're going to discuss today. As you all know, Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine is a terrible tragedy that is causing untold human suffering and destruction. The military invasion has been going on for a month now and has already cost thousands of lives on both sides, wounded many more, caused massive destruction in Ukraine and forced millions of people to leave everything behind and flee their homes. The war has immense costs and consequences. Of course, first and foremost, as in every war, for the people directly affected, who lose their lives or their loved ones, their homes and dreams, whose futures are disrupted or destroyed. And as in every other war, it is important to keep in mind that it impacts dif people differently. Many women and children were forced to flee. Men aged 18 to 60 years are not allowed to flee and seek safety outside Ukraine. Not everybody may be able to flee in the first place, maybe because they're old or sick or disabled or need to take care of others who cannot flee. Pregnant women had to give birth in underground stations or were bombed in maternity wards. There are first reports of women being raped by soldiers. Journalists have been particularly targeted. They have been abducted or killed. And there have been reports that indicate that the situation is particularly dangerous for LGBTQI minorities. And then there were many reports of African students and other people of color who were hindered from fleeing. It is clear that Ukraine's future is in danger, although Ukrainians are bravely defending their country. And looking beyond the situation in Ukraine, it is also clear that the war has massive consequences on the rest of the world. Russia has become a full dictatorship and apart from the economic impact of the sanctions, the situation is becoming even more dangerous for dissenters, journalists, critical academic activists and minority groups due to the government's increasingly hard crackdown. Thousands of people have already fled Russia as a consequence and many people have ended up in prison. Europe has seen the biggest humanitarian crisis since the end of the Second World War. Russia's war of aggression is an attack on international law, on the European peace order and the rules-based international order. Of course, people in Eastern Europe in particular are worried about a further escalation of the situation. Putin has threatened to use nuclear weapons and the danger of further military escalation is unfortunately far from over. While its full implications, for example, for the European security architecture aren't clear yet, what is clear is that it is a turning point in history and that it will have major consequences around the world in political, economic and security terms. It might lead to a further destabilization in Central Asia. We already see that other wars and crises like the situation in Afghanistan get less and less attention, which is one of the reasons why the West has been accused of hypocrisy. It is clear that especially poor countries in the global south will be struggling with hunger crises and fuel crises and that the war is likely to exacerbate security crises and other conflicts around the world. Everybody is watching how especially the Chinese government positions itself. In recent years, a number of countries had announced a feminist foreign policy, which was an important development. Now, however, the focus is once again strongly on rearmament and militarization and not only in Europe. There are instruments such as the UN's Women, Peace and Security Agenda that are supposed to ensure that it is not only the fighting parties whose interests are considered during an armed conflict, but that the needs and interests uh, of women, and minority groups are represented as well. But as often during such crisis situations, these instruments are not applied at the moment. So despite the volatility of the situation and the ongoing war, we would like to discuss possibilities for peace in Ukraine, in Europe and the world. As you can see in the program, we want to discuss first, as I said, possibilities for achieving peace in Ukraine now, then the implications of the war for peace in Europe, 
but also broaden the focus to perspectives um, on the war and its implications from the global south, here with a focus on India. And since this seems to be a turning point at which the post-Cold War order is over and the world seems to be entering a new phase of confrontation and conflict, we also want to discuss what we can learn from our research on how not only to end wars, but to prevent new ones. Can we already say how the conflict might affect global cooperation and how can we build sustainable peace? We are pleased to welcome a panel of experts from around the world, from Ukraine and Germany, from Canada and India, who will discuss the consequences of the war from different academic perspectives and positionalities and will try to point to possible ways forward. And before I hand over to our moderator for today, let me say a few words on how we will proceed. We will first have um, opening statements by our speakers and a discussion among the panelists, and then we will open the, up the floor for questions from the audience. So please send us your questions um, via this um, Q&A function or F&A function, and we will then collect them uh, and, and read them to the panelists. And after our discussion, my colleague Cornelia Ulbert, who is the Executive Director of the Institute for Development and Peace, ENEF, will offer some reflections and concluding remarks. Now, before we start, let me briefly introduce our moderator. Andreas Zumach is a freelance journalist and author who was a long-term correspondent in Geneva for German newspaper Taz and others. And he has covered topics related to the United Nations, international politics, international law, NATO, as well as related to international conflicts, among them the one in Ukraine, um, Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Um, Andreas Zumach moderated another Keter Hamburger dialogue for us last year um, on the failed intervention in Afghanistan. We are very happy to welcome you back to the center, even though the occasion is again a very sad one. And yes, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Patricia, and thank you very much for having the honor to moderate this panel of very, very distinguished uh, speakers. Let me just introduce them briefly in the order of uh, their introductory remarks. First is uh, Professor Dr. David Carmen. He is a Canadian citizen and he is a former fellow of the Kerta Hamburger College. And now he is a professor of international affairs at Carlton University. Carlton University is in the Canadian capital of um, Ottawa, of, um, Ottawa. And his expertise are in conflict analysis uh, mediation, international organization, and negotiation and policy analysis, and he is an expert on Ukraine. Second in order is uh, Dr. Oksana Hus. She is Ukrainian citizen, but currently studying and researching at the Italian University of Bologna, and she is a co-founder of the Interdisciplinary Corruption Research Network. Her expertise lies in um, the Ukraine, and then there's a focus of hybrid regimes, anti-corruption research, and open government. Number three is uh, also from uh, Ukraine, Dr. Tamara Matsenyuk. She is associate professor at the University of Kiev, uh, Mohilia, but currently she lives in Berlin, like many by now, many, many tens of thousands of Ukrainians who came as refugees. She will be working at the Free University and her expertise is, uh, she is a feminist sociologist. She has worked on uh, the Maidan and the Donbas wars and she is doing that from a feminist and a gender perspective. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Sita Tripathi. He is a senior fellow at the Kerta Hamburger College and he is a visiting lecturer at the Willy Brandt School of Public Policy at the University in Erfurt, and uh, his uh, expertise lies in peace and conflict studies, conflict transformation and peace building, European Union civilian crisis management mission, and certainly India's foreign policy. Please, David, you are to start. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Andreas. I wish we were meeting uh, under different circumstances. Uh, under normal circumstances, I think we would we would relish the opportunity to be able to collaborate and work together. I had that such an opportunity uh, working with my colleagues at the Global Center uh, several years ago. And it was there where we began some research on the initial intervention, the annexation 
of uh, Crimea and eventually the uh, spillover into Eastern Ukraine. And we looked at it from the perspective of what opportunities lay ahead for some form of global cooperation, not the least of which would be mediation. So what I hope to do just very briefly is walk our listeners through um, the prospects for mediation based on what has been done in the previous eight years. And I think there's reason to believe that if uh, the prospects are good, and right now they are not looking very good, that mediation has a place in resolving this conflict. I say that because I think there's a, uh, an institutional process in place. There's keen interest among some of the players, uh, at least on the Western side of the equation, to engage in dialogue. There has a historical precedent there in the form of both French and German interventions along the way. So what I hope to do very briefly in the time allotted to me is just walk you through some of the uh, evidence from the past and then reflect briefly on the prospects for mediating this conflict down the road. I think it's fair to say that right now the prospects of any kind of uh, peaceful resolution of this conflict are, is looking fairly bleak, but nevertheless, there, we have to at least consider any opportunity, a window of opportunity, no matter how small. So when we look at the past evidence, in particular the mediation efforts in Crimea and then Eastern Ukraine, we see that quite frankly, uh, there was a paucity of mediation efforts in Crimea, in large part because of the preemptive nature of Russia's annexation of the Crimea region, uh, which gave uh, third parties very little time to actually engage in dialogue between the Ukraine proper and the Russian side. Nevertheless, there were several efforts undertaken, both from within Ukraine as well as more regionally. Uh, various individuals, including Secretary of State Kerry, as well as his counterpart in Russia, Lavrov, as well as the, uh, at the time, a minister, not President Poroshenko, was involved, as was the OSD and Angela Merkel. All these uh, efforts to convince Russia to withdraw its forces or come to some kind of uh, settlement uh, regarding some claims to territory that we're making fail. Uh, they, in fact, uh, failed to reverse the course of direction in that, in that particular instance, um, despite the accusations that the referendum that would subsequently take place was illegal. Uh, there was no constitutional provision for it. And really what it came down to was the lack of time, but also a willingness, I think, to engage the Crimean people uh, in a dialogue on what the opportunities and uh, solutions might be to staying within Ukraine proper. There were a number of possible uh, compromises available, including some claim that Russia might make over Sevastopol or some claim that Ukraine might make over the northern sub-regions, but these weren't taken seriously. So as a result, we, we don't have much of a precedent to draw on from the Crimea example. But it's when we look at the Donbass where things began to heat up and more specifically, the conflict became incredibly more violent and bloody that we see a much more concerted effort on the part of third parties to attempt to find a solution, a common ground between the warring factions. Now it's important at this, at this point to point out that uh, Russia wasn't claiming any direct intervention in Donbass. So this was kind of uh, a recognition that the people that were fighting in the Donbass were proxy representatives of, of Russia proper. And this made the, um, the efforts to resolve the, the conflict in the Donbass even more difficult because what, what was lacking here was some direct linkage between the actions of the Russian government and the proxy parties that were um, engaging in violence in, in Eastern Ukraine proper. So there was, in, in essence, uh, support from Russia to the uh, separatist movements within North, uh, eastern Ukraine on the one hand, while at the same time, further Western involvement to uh, arm Ukraine and uh, eventually make it more capable to uh, provide some significant military opposition to that uh, increasing Russian presence in eastern Ukraine. Within the sort of escalatory process, we see a number of significant mediation efforts taking place. We see the initial establishment of, of the trilateral contact group, which comprised Russia, uh, Ukraine, and the OSCE. The OSC taking the lead on a number of significant dialogues, and at the least of which would be the Minsk I, and then the subsequent Minsk II agreements. I'll uh, briefly separate those two out in a moment. We also see some more concerted effort on the part of various 
Western representatives, most notably uh, American representatives um, who were engaging in dialogue with their counterparts on the Russian side. Essentially what we see now is an enlarging of the conflict in which um, the key parties to this conflict are no longer localized, but not even regionalized, but also internationalized. And this ultimately would lead to a, a de decrease in, in the reduction in the prospects for long lasting peace and stability. So we have the OSC mission, which is a special monitoring mission, uh, engaging with parties at all levels. Essentially, its job was to gather information and report on the security situation. It wasn't really in, in a position to interpose or impose a solution on the parties, but really to provide a fact-finding capacity so that culpability and responsibility could be assigned. This was important in the sense that there were terms of an agreement in the Minsk II that would be uh, very specific in terms of what the obligations of the warring factions were. So let's turn very briefly to those, those uh, Minsk I and Minsk II proof calls. Given the time constraint, I'll just basically point out the distinction between the two. Initially, the Minsk I protocol that was introduced was really an effort to get the two sides to agree on some basic fundamental uh, principles of war fighting. Uh, for example, improving the humanitarian situation and eventually creating a political solution, which may be in accordance with Ukrainian law, withdrawing of illegal armed groups, withdrawing military, military equipment and so on, and even designated mercenaries and, and such. But Minsk II went further because of it, what was quickly uh, observable on the ground was that uh, large and heavy weapons were being used by both sides. And there was no provision for, for withdrawing those weapons to a safe area that they could not inflict harm on the opposing side. Keep in mind that approximately 14,000 people were killed in this conflict up to 2021, with an estimated 1,000 civilians killed uh, over that eight year period. So this is not an insignificant effort on the part of the, the OSC to introduce some degree of verifiable culpability. Uh, MIS-2 went much further, and it was at this point we see the emergence of the Normandy format which carried through almost in, in a de facto sense right through uh, to 2022, where France and Germany being the key players along with Russia and Ukraine were in constant dialogue. The one continuity from beginning to end, in my view, uh, which ensured that this conflict did not unravel was Angela Merkel's presence throughout. She had the ear of both sides. She was a credible mediator. She went to a significant effort to ensure that arms buildup uh, that was seen as a provocative measure on both sides were kept to a minimum. In fact, she famously faced down John McCain, the uh, Republican senator who uh, recommended that Ukraine be heavily armed with offensive weapons back in 2015. Uh, she noted that no amount of weapons would resolve this conflict. I believe she was right then, and I believe she is right now, that the intrusion of heavy weapons is actually hampering any prospects for lasting peace. Nevertheless, she was the anchor. Her departure led to a significant unraveling of the process. And we know, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm speaking to the, uh, the converted here, preaching to the converted here. We know how the situation has been significantly transformed then. But in some sense, Merkel was able to keep a toehold on some dialogue and process. France as well. All that seemed to have uh, come apart and unraveled um, in the lead up to uh, the Russian invasion of, of this er, of earlier this year. Uh, what, what is essentially uh, a significant part of the Normandy format and the dialogue that unfolded over the, the eight year period was some progress being made on three different dimensions, the so-called Steinmeier formula, which was introduced back in 2014, that there would be a sequencing of changes within Eastern Ukraine such that they would engage in political dialogue, military dialogue and security dimensions as well. And there was some progress being made in the military component, which uh, basically made certain zones within Eastern Ukraine ceasefire zones. And these were being held to up until 2021. Now, so I, I, my, my feeling is that there was some progress in being made over the eight year period in achieving some degree of common understanding of what needed to be done to ensure 
that Eastern Ukraine could be held uh, held to account. The people of Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine, could be held to account, but there could also be some degree of lasting peace in Ukraine. Unfortunately, from my perspective, there was significant pressure placed on on Russia in the form of sanctions simultaneously, uh, along with efforts by primarily the U.S. to uh, provide Ukraine with offensive weapons, which in my view changed the balance of power, if you will. Uh, whether you agree that Russia was provoked into taking a preemptive uh, attack on Russia or you believe that this attack was unwarranted, we have to grapple with the fact that um, neither party was uh, fully committed to a lasting settlement and peace. By then, when you have both the United States and Russia facing off against each other, the prospects for a lasting peace and settlement are fairly limited. So what do we take away from this particular crisis in terms of mediation? Well, what we're facing here is a, a significant challenge in, in terms of what I would characterize as a gray zone conflict in which the actual confrontation between the major powers is, uh, is not taking place in the form of formal warfare or war fighting. We have economic warfare directed uh, by both sides against the opposing factions as opposed to the uh, individuals responsible for the war itself. So um, we have a threshold of, of culpability that is difficult to determine and specify. Uh, and as such, it's very difficult to discern or discriminate exactly what the intentions are of both parties. And in the absence of understanding what both parties' end goals or end games are, it's very difficult to determine what is the overlap or the consensus that might be reached in terms of what would be satisfactory to both sides. Um, to, to concretize this, it's not clear if the West's end goal is regime change, withdrawal, or the collapse of Russia. All things might be desirable, but from the Ru Russian perspective, it's, if it's the collapse of the Russian economy or the isolation of Russia, this would see, be seen as an existential threat and therefore probably force them to dig in even deeper. On the other hand, Russia's goals, although they did have their red line specified, are also unclear. Is it the full occupation of Ukraine, regime change, or even as some might describe, the expansion of Russian influence beyond Ukraine's borders? These things are unknown and unstated, given that we cannot uh, ascertain what the objectives are of both sides, of both sides of the uh, those who are supporting the belligerents, specifically from the Western side, it's very difficult to find some common ground. We are in essence uh, in uncharted territory with global and regional consequences and impact. What I would suggest is that so far the heavy handed mediation strategies that have taken place, to be clear, there have been several rounds of dialogue between Zelensky and his representatives and the Russian, his Russian counterparts, all have failed mostly in part because the demands made, being made by Russia against Ukraine are seen as unreasonable. I, but I also believe that uh, the president is trying to buy some more time so that his side, the Ukrainian uh, army can become more forceful, more capable to retake land the, uh, and territory and save more people. So we have a heavy handed mediation strategy, threats in the form of it, uh, taking Vladimir Putin to the International Criminal Court, increasing arm flows and sanctions. All these are what I would call negative uh, factors that will probably entrench the Russian uh, position even further until such time Russia is no longer capable of conducting the war in the way it sees fit. This is a, a tragedy in so many ways because lives are being lost, but the global catastrophic impacts are unmeasured and unknown. So ultimately we have to confront the fact that, as to whether the current effort, which combines uh, dialogue along with uh, heavy handed uh, support for threats uh, directed against both sides, is going to be an effective long term solution. And I'll leave it there and hopefully we can return to the question of what lay ahead uh, for Ukraine in terms of various scenarios. I don't want to treat this as a subject, uh, uh, you know, in an abstract way. I, I realize that. The, there's a significant loss of life here. Um, but I think the position so far is that there is no clear, discernible pathway out of this conflict unless Russia were to be basically um, 
driven out of Ukraine proper. And it's not clear that they're willing to do that at this point. Okay, David, thanks a lot. I think we will come to that. Uh, there was probably a lot of questions already, just me and other. Second in the order is uh, Oksana Rus. It's your turn. Please turn on your microphone, yeah. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this uh, event, this round table. And uh, this is very useful that David uh, made a reference to the uh, beginning of this war in 2014. Um, because uh, I would like to continue and to make the point that Ukraine that Russia invaded in 2014 is a very different one in 2022 than it used to be. And this is something that uh, both on the one hand Putin miscalculated and on the other hand, this is something that puzzles very much the West. I recently saw an article even with the uh, heading, I don't remember what was the source, but uh, that winning Ukraine is more troubling for Western elites because they don't know what to do with it uh, in the end. And why is that? Because this is questioning many, um, like the winning Ukraine now or the resilient Ukraine. We cannot say it won already, but uh, the resilient Ukraine in this very war, it puts uh, in question many structures and many ways of thinking that we have in the security policy uh, around the world, in the security structures. And I would like to uh, address the process that Ukraine undergone in this six or seven last years uh, that shows uh, many implications also for the speed how the world is changing and how maybe we should rethink uh, the structures and the thinking about the uh, democracy, but also about the security and uh, the state as such. So my question is, uh, what makes Ukraine resilient? And um, I would like to address it through highlighting the pe peculiarity of democracy in this very moment as the collaborative democracy in Ukraine. And uh, the peculiarity is this partnership between the society and the state. So Ukraine undergone uh, in the last six years, very comprehensive reforms. and. Uh, usually liberal democracies uh, that have rigid and fixed uh, developed democratic institutions, they cannot even imagine the speed of reforms that is possible in such a transitioning state as Ukraine. And this is why these reforms are quite underestimated. And then they are not reflected in the quantitative measurements that are there yet. Uh, in the same time, these reforms, they've been accompanied by increasing civic duty, uh, the feeling of the ownership in the society and readiness to protest. So these are uh, the studies, research done by Olha Onu, uh, Henry Hale, um, Kulikov, uh, that I very much recommend and I have, I have no time to address now, but uh, they've done a fascinating research about the identity of Ukrainians that has been changing in the recent years and showed that uh, exactly this uh, trends of uh, increasing civic duty and the readiness to protest, it's on the seven years high right now. So that was a really bad moment to invade in Ukraine uh, and not considering all these uh, trends. What I would like to uh, address are three successful reforms that um, under, uh, that Ukraine undergone in uh, the last six years. So the first one is reform of decentralization. Um, on the one hand, uh, in Ukraine uh, had been uh, um, the, uh, all the units on the local level, they've been restructured and um, created new uh, administrative uh, units, amalgamated hermadas which uh, the purpose of this reform was to increase efficiency in providing uh, administrative services. Um, in the same time, these Romadas, they uh, increased political and fiscal independence. Uh, in the same time, again, uh, the uh, open government initiatives, they became very much uh, popular on the local level. So what means uh, the we have the situation where local level gets uh, more political 
possibilities to decide, more finance, and in the same time, through open government initiatives, or citizen participation and transparency initiatives, uh, there is increasing communication with the citizens about what they want, what they can. So, and there is a lot of collaboration in providing and initiating improvements on the local level. Uh, just as an example, almost one third of Romadas introduced um, participatory budgeting, which means that citizens they got a share of the local budget that they can spend for the projects they vote for, and they also participate in the implementation of this project, which is quite uh, difficult to imagine even for such a post-communist state uh, with all the legacy from Soviet times as Russia. Uh, this is what makes Ukraine very different in these terms and what um, improved the quality of democracy in the very last uh, years. How does it help now in, in the war? So the war is fought uh, very much on the local level and we have uh, different, uh, so usually in Ukraine, they are speaking of three different clusters of Hromadas. Um, they are now under uh, fulfilling uh, military administration uh, services. And uh, local governments, they are responsible for maintaining all the infrastructure. So for example, in Kharkiv that you know, the city that was heavily under attack in the third, year, uh, third week of the war, they were still able to collect trash. Uh, some Mahramadas, they are already introducing schooling and education online. Uh, of course, the medicine, this is again under the uh, responsibility of Hromadas, so of this local level uh, administrations. Uh, there are also very few traitors uh, on the local level, and in those Hromadas that they were traitors on the uh, local authority side, usually the citizens, they went for the peaceful protests and uh, they showed the identity with Ukraine. So this decentralization reform, uh, it allowed now, well, I don't have the data obviously, and uh, it's difficult to make this inference uh, about causalities, but obviously it strengthened the local level government and this partnership between citizens and local governments, which makes or helps at least supports this resilience on the local level. The second comprehensive reform was the anti-corruption reform. Uh, Ukraine is very much well known uh, in all the indexes as a very highly corrupt country. But in 2020, we saw the first signs, first indices uh, on the qualitative level, I mean, that the reform was um, working and bringing the fruits. And one of them is uh, that uh, high uh, anti-corruption court was uh, bringing up uh, the cases and uh, judging high political corruption cases. Well, the response to that in the very same year was the uh, constitutional crisis. I don't want to get into details, but this crisis uh, was aimed to undermine anti-corruption reform. And uh, among the initiatives of uh, this crisis were the judges uh, with links uh, to Russia. Uh, another side of the anti-corruption reform was um, the reform of defense and security sector. The sector as such, you can imagine, is hugely difficult to uh, reform in any way because it's close and this is the only sector that one can uh, fairly say that uh, there shouldn't be transparency. Uh, but in defense and security sector, with uh, collaboration with the independent uh, committee against corruption for defense, in collaboration with civil society, they were able to uh, reform the public procurement and to reform state-owned enterprises, how they function. So again, the things that are really um, substantial and they were changed qualitatively in the very few years. Uh, obviously, the result for the war is better functioning uh, state institutions and also better functioning military. Uh, now, what is also important, the mechanism how the anti-corruption reform uh, 
uh, has been conducted. And the mechanism was the sandwich that civil society um, makes pressure on the government through international partners, which made civil society very much exercising advocacy and very much well connected internationally. How does it help now in the war? In the winning of information war, because the civil society who, are re who were active in these reforms, they are now the uh, pillars, so to say, in developing argumentation and reaching out and advocating the um, arguments for the help for Ukraine and uh, for generate uh, the international support. And the last reform that um, we cannot forget, and this is really, really important one, is the digital transformation in Ukraine uh, that was taking place in the last six years again. So uh, the uh, Ministry of Digital Transformation has been created a very progressive one with the minister of 20, uh, 32 years old uh, and hold the department running in the hoodies. Uh, so this uh, digital transformation took place again on the national level and subnational level, so the local level, uh, in the form of introducing electronic documentation, e-governance, so all administrative services were uh, put into the uh, electronic uh, or online space, and also electronic democracy. On the institutional level, the network of uh, chief ex of um, uh, technology officers on the local level has been created, uh, which also allowed to support introduction or implementation of this reform on the local level. Now we see the communication is one of the uh, crucial points why Ukraine is still staying. So the ability to um, ensure communication, even in the damaged areas that people have uh, access to Ukrainian TV, radio, to internet. This is crucial for staying firm and for uh, providing resistance. And also fighting cyber war, cyber attacks. This is also on the account of this uh, Ministry of Digital Transformation and to this digital uh, reform. In the same time, this um, electronic um, or online uh, widespread uh, online services, they allow for the country to function on the daily basis in the even in this uh, difficult situation. So I know personally, many Ukrainians who went already abroad, they continue to work for their companies for their firms, uh, online kids, they are uh, having online schooling. So this um, makes a difference uh, all, not only actually to the Ukraine in 2014, but it makes the difference how the world is functioning and makes evident how the different ways the, uh, of resilience are important. So uh, to sum up, these extremely fast changes, they show that not only increasing um, military capacity is important, and this is not the thing that makes Ukraine resilient. Of course, all the help with military helps, but this is not the crucial pillar. And this is why I think this uh, inferences or conclusions that, for example, Germany invests now 100 billions into uh, military equipment, they are wrong. So resilience from Ukraine shows we need different approaches, we need new approaches and new way of thinking of the world in order to approach at all this crisis and uh, to find the solutions for this situation. Thank you very much. Osama. Thank you. And Tamara is next, please. You have to turn on your mic, okay. Oh yeah, Oksana, thanks a lot for your presentation actually. I will continue in the similar logic because I will try to show how uh, when we study women's involvement in Russia's war against Ukraine, it's also possible to understand better the specificity of uh, current Ukrainian society and how it changed uh, for last uh, years. And actually from this, my illustration, you could see 
that it's combination of both caring for the country as a metaphor, but also like a resistance. Uh, and I want to start with the results of a representative poll that was conducted by InfoSapiens for the British Research Agency um, around uh, months, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And we could see that uh, 67 percentage of people are ready to personally participate in the armed resistance to end the Russian occupation of Ukraine. And among them, uh, of course, men are more, but still more than half of uh, women are ready to participate in the arms. It could uh, perceived as a, a very actually a sur surprising result because very often women through like more feminist perspective as, uh, are perceived as those who appeal for peace, who are ready for peace, but actually, as we could see uh, later, women are ready to uh, resist and they are doing this. Actually, as Oksana also tried to sh uh, show in her uh, presentation, um, uh, for Ukrainian society, resistance uh, and changes are not new thing. And uh, from as a result, and during uh, Yevromaidan protests in 2013-14, uh, Ukrainian women they managed to challenge traditional gender roles as uh, those who are doing caretaking and as victims of conflict and reclaimed visibility, recognition and respect as um, those who are uh, making revolution and who are volunteers. And when war in Donbass started, women also joined front lines as volunteers, journalists, medical staff and military. And actually, uh, I was uh, uh, from 2015 together with research team of sociologists, we did a large sociological study called Invisible Battalion. And it's about women in armed forces, especially on the combat positions that before were forbidden for women. And because uh, our hearings, they were eager to fight for their labor rights in armed forces, actually uh, we manage and we succeed in uh, uh, successful integration of women in armed forces, especially on combat positions. Also, we we, uh, we tried to make visible women as uh, female veterans and actually as a result of Donbass war, uh, there are around half a million veterans in Ukraine and they are those who are now in uh, also fighting in uh, armed forces and territorial uh, self-defense and women are quite also visible group and according to data actually women constantly Constitute around 10 percentage of Ukrainian armed forces. And uh, there were some changes in armed forces and it became possible also to do study to, uh, to criticize armed forces and to talk about sexual harassment in military, like bullying, suicides. And then actually as a result, uh, we see now that uh, women are involved uh, in resistance as uh, from one hand uh, agents and actors and uh, now uh, uh, online there are a number of different actually self-made posters where you could see Ukrainian women who resist also different pictures of uh, military women who uh, address to enemies to Russian soldiers like you uh, you came on our land and you will die and actually women of different ages they participate and even older women and uh, also there are female volunteers who unfortunately were killed by Russians when they were trying to save for example uh, animals and this uh, uh, this poster became also a symbol of Ukrainian uh, resistance where woman uh, she 
is trying to uh, actually to evacuate the uh, pet dogs with disability from Irpin and uh, women are uh, very actively involved and it's possible to say that it's actually people's war. Uh, a lot of people, they are uh, fighting, volunteering, the whole country is actually volunteering. But at the same time, of course, women are victims and vulnerable groups in the war. And uh, women are those who take care of uh, kids, uh, elderly, people with disability, and actually major majority of refugees, uh, uh, vast majority, they are women. And now there are risks of of human trafficking. Also, there are already example cases in Ukraine where women were raped by Russian soldiers and all this uh, problems of course they are also very important when we talk about like uh, feminist peace building and also involving uh, uh, women as vulnerable groups uh, in uh, in this mediation or uh, negotiation but uh, you know when uh, when i came uh, i spent uh, nine days uh, in kiev uh, and after I couldn't stand uh, these missiles and bombs. I decided to evacuate and ended up in uh, Berlin. And I here attend some uh, protests. And I see that, uh, so I attended one protest. I see that this uh, ideas of peace, uh, Putin uh, give peace, they are uh, like among major issues. And uh, for me, uh, as a person who who are from a country where actually there is one month of war and today my I had it was funeral of my grandmother that I couldn't visit and it's really a very terrible situation as one of example you see this symbolic action in Lviv and in this situation where you have uh, Russian soldiers that destroy your country, it's very difficult to talk about peace and uh, about uh, negotiations with Russia according to Russian scenario. And uh, 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 but uh, actually, there are some examples where women appeal uh, to stop the war. And uh, a couple of days ago, Ukrainian military women, they made video to Belarus brothers and sisters to stop the war. And actually, there is threat of uh, war from, uh, uh, from Belarus. But actually, these examples, they are very few. The same women, just a couple of days before they appeal to Russian soldiers with more militarism yes with more uh, with the threat that uh, you came to our land and you will die in it and I just want to finish with uh, symbolism because uh, in the situation where a man, uh, you know, there is this hashtag close the sky and actually in Kyiv, from my personal experience, I would say that in Kyiv uh, it would be possible to stay if not missiles and bombs. And this uh, shelter, the sky notion was... Mm -mm, uh, in the situation when it's not supported by NATO, uh, we have this <laughs> uh, we have this um, symbolic support from Ukrainian witches. Kiev is famous, uh, according to your different leg legends, uh, as a place where there were a lot of uh, witches and they were not uh, uh, killed during medieval times. And uh, uh, and actually, you see that. But, uh, uh, this uh, uh, so sometimes the symbolism is used even by Ukrainian uh, military in a more uh, in a way that uh, women, which is Valkyrias, uh, help uh, the army to do this or that, and some and some women also even military women they call themselves like well Valkyrias or witches, and it's uh, uh, this. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, this uh, symbolism is a thing that uh, uh, you could <laughs> sometimes use in the situation when uh, your um, you know neighbors colleagues uh, uh, doesn't help you to uh, to resist i think i will stop here and i will be glad to answer your questions yeah before we do that we have the four speaker, so it's Siddharth's turn. Thank you, Tamar. But we will come back to you in a few minutes. Siddharth, please. Yeah, thank you, Andreas. Uh, before I, I, I speak, I would really like to thank uh, Oksana and Tamara for uh, uh, having the courage to sort of know and being brave to come and talk to us. I mean, for a lot of us, it's just a crisis, you know, and people talk in, in the terms of it as a case of crisis, whereas it, it's a lived experience for you. And uh, having followed followed uh, more cases in Afghanistan, Bosnia, Kosovo, I mean, it's very. Uh, I know how this this uh, discussion would at some point, you know, people would be uh, fatigued by it, and then it would be forgotten. But what I'm more, uh, I mean, I'm worried, and as a recent conflict study scholar, uh, it's it's how it's going to really impact and and. Uh, uh, and then forge a sort of a new world order. And, and when I talk about the world order, uh, what I remember is a, is a famous saying by in Swahili, uh, uh, and then it, it, this, it, it goes like this, when the elephant fights, it's the, it's the grass that suffers. So when we talk about uh, the grass here, whether we look at Ukraine as a state or whether we look at the global South, so where exactly do do they have a choice in that sense? And then, but they all sort of you know uh, face the impact of it. Now, when we talk about uh, uh, that, it's it, it's uh, it's really unfortunate to sort of you know uh, uh, see and also uh, how the world is getting shaped. And the problematic aspect I find is that it's it's getting very divisive. I mean, it's always there has been a lot of discussion on either or, and, 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 and that's not something which uh, countries in the global south have the privilege to decide uh, in terms of whose side are they on. In, and, and I mean, so at one level, they are caught between whether to uh, uh, condemn Russia or not, uh, principally they should, but at the other level, the either or is also about whether they focus on the interest or on the focus on their principles. So there are a lot of these, these discussions which are, uh, uh, which are really problematic. Like for example, the discussion in India is also about uh, growing, uh, growing the need for having more arms. So, you know, uh, it, it's also moving away from, uh, and from its non-reliance on say Russian uh, arms to also thinking that we should have more arms, but I mean, one is good that you don't rely on a, on a country, but the second is not good because it's leading to broader militarization. I think uh, uh, something which uh, Oksana was also talking about that you know it's, there's all this discussion about we should have more more weapons and and so much funding should go on defense, but I'm not particularly sure if it's really if you're talking about sustainable peace in the long run, it's it's really going to help, especially for for uh, countries in the global south where uh, uh, they should be spending more on on uh, other things, and and of course the crisis is going to really impact them in terms of uh, uh, inflationary pressures and and looking at high costs, and uh, also uh, they are going to impact you know purchasing power of, of people who are there. But I think it's it's also uh, uh, important to understand that uh, there's a lot of similarity between the post-colonial states or the states in the global south to Ukraine because. Uh, Ukraine is also at least part of the post-Soviet colonial space where it has this history of sort of national self-affirmation. And I think that is something which uh, a lot of uh, states in the global south understand. And, and also uh, this, this national self-affirmation is also in odds with uh, Russia's sort of economic and cultural role, something which I think a lot of countries have had uh, a face. But interestingly, it was not Russia, it was Europe or it was United States. So it, it, it's, it's a very sort of uh, difficult situation for the countries uh, in the global south to be in. Uh, and, and 
And what is uh, interesting is it's the same situation that they had a uh, few decades back during the Cold War, where the whose side are you on? But I think they took a very, uh, uh, what is important and that might be a, a way forward is also going to the principles of non-aligned movement or panchil, where uh, there was a focus on dialogue, of course. Uh, it might be very difficult in the situation right now, but uh, overall, if we see it was on mutual respect for, for each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty, mutual non-aggression, non-interference in each other's internal affairs, e equality and cooperation, uh, and also peaceful coexistence. So that is something which I feel uh, uh, becomes becomes important in, in such a context. And uh, uh, as much as there has been criticism about India's stance, I think uh, it's very important to understand that the existing realities of every country is very different. Uh, it might it, it might be uh, different for Europe as well as for South Asia, or when you look at uh, uh, North Africa or or other contexts. Uh, and the discussion which I have seen in, in, uh, in especially in India, was that uh, Russia, Russia is not our problem. Russia is West's problem. And NATO is not our problem. NATO is Russia's problem. So what is the problem if we talk about in, in, in the context of India? It is, we have Afghanistan where Taliban is in power. We have Pakistan. We have China with whom we had war and with also Pakistan. So these are, I think, uh, things that that you know or make it very very difficult. Uh, even though, if you look at the abstention or at least uh, on the UN resolution, even though it abstained, but I think the point makes it makes very clear all the discussion, all the arguments that India has made, that uh, it it nowhere supports uh, what Russia has done, even though it did not take the name, because I th I think it has never happened that you know we've we've, we've done that. But uh, there was a very clear sort of, you know, understanding of it. But but it also exposes sort of, you know, the fault lines that exist in the West and also uh, and how it's going to be able to cooperate with other countries. I mean, countries in the global south do have their doubts. If West cannot really come to rescue Ukraine, how are they going to come to rescue us? So what do we do then? That's, I think, a very big question for a for, uh, lot of countries. But also uh, another point I wanted to mention was and I'm going back to the point of either or, when we have also looked at the discussion on how the uh, the media has actually sort of you know looked at the entire uh, sort of uh, conflict here, and and how much uh, uh, importance has been given, and also uh, exposing sort of the hypocrisy which exists in the West, and in terms of uh, when we looked at the the uh, uh, recent developments in Afghanistan, it already seems that that has been forgotten and if we go back further, and my fear is that that might also happen to Ukraine. So what we are not looking at at the broad questions. You know, we have been just sort of looking at uh, these, these uh, issues, I think, in isolation. So what? how do we sort of, you know, go, go beyond that? It is something uh, 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 one needs to sort of, you know, consider. I would stop that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sitar. First question to the four of you. Is there anything you want to react to, uh, something you have heard from one of the other three? If this is not the case, I will address a question to each of you. We are running later than we planned because everybody was long, longer than uh, we had planned, but I think uh, this is very okay because I think it was very interesting for the overall audience what all of you had to say so please be with us my first question goes back to david well, you have um, described um, why all the uh, diplomatic efforts since 2014 failed my question to you is uh, was it only because uh, more or less both sides uh, did not implement what was had been agreed or are there also uh, loopholes and um, discrepancies in the Minsk agreements, especially the question, for instance, what should be the order of events in implementation uh, regional elections in the Donbas or first uh, departure of all uh, Russian green men and other kind of support. And the other issue, which I understand is a big obstacle, whether if there is any kind of future special status of Donbas agreed upon, should Donbas then have a veto power over 
foreign policy decisions of the government in Kiev. So isn't it also true that there are some things that have been not resolved or left open both in Minsk I and Minsk II and also in the Steinmauer formula, which uh, both sides could interp interpret their way? David. You have to open your mic. David, your mic. David, your microphone. Your yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Uh, so yeah, the moderator, I thought it was, I think we were flipping back and forth. So um, this is the million dollar question. How did we get from what was essentially a frozen conflict with the prospect for long-term uh, stability absent large-scale violence, I mean, not to dismiss 14,000 dead, but it was a localized conflict in which uh, one could argue that absent Crimea, which is a slightly different set of problems, absent, absent outside parties, and by that I mean extra regional players, I hold them somewhat responsible for the escalation of conflict. Uh, how did we get from a very localized conflict. What essentially now, as we've just heard from your, from our fourth speaker, Siddhartha, uh, a globalized war. I mean, we, we are talking about a, a situation that some have described as World War III, with uh, Canada committing a battalion-sized number of volunteers uh, coming coming into the war, uh, twenty thousand volunteers recruited around the world, and then Russia raising armed forces from Syria and elsewhere. How did, we, how did we get so rapidly from a situation which arguably was manageable to a situation which is now has catastrophic nuclear war consequences? And that I, I, I personally believe that neither side has thought through clearly the consequences of their actions. On the one hand, we have obviously Russia's, I think, ill-advised effort to control the, the, the future, if you will, the political, social, political future of Ukraine, I think clearly overestimating the linkages that, that Russia had with so-called ethnic brethren or diaspora in uh, Ukraine proper, uh, beyond simply the controlled ter territory of Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, on the one hand, and on the other hand, a miscalculation from the West that uh, Russia would be easily deterred once it saw the looming threat of economic warfare sitting at its doorstep. Neither side, in other words, is willing to back down. And what we have to understand, I think, is that the actions of both sides are responsible for getting us where we are. Well, it's easy and convenient to suggest that Putin walked away from Minsk too. I think there was also some unwillingness on the part of the West, uh, in particular Zelensky, who during the Normandy talks, the most recent one being the most significant talks during the Normandy format took place in 2019, in which he and uh, Macron and, and Merkel and Putin sat down and talked through the three areas that they should focus on, political, economic, and military, or sorry, security, political, and military. And there was some agreement, some consensus on securing certain zones free of, of large-scale uh, fire uh, and warfare, but where they could not budge, neither side was really willing to recognize the political agreement that would be necessary in, ter in terms of how to sequence in recognition of autonomous yeah. parties within Eastern Ukraine. And whether, I'm not a mind reader, whether Putin saw this as a signal that there was really no sincere effort on the part of the West. One has to remember that Donald Trump was being impeached at this time. So he was essentially absent from this discussion. And that was a, a clear signal for Macron and Merkel to move in and take, take charge and responsibility for the dialogue. And they were making progress. Unfortunately, we had a series of, uh, I think, very debilitating uh, economic sanctions placed on Russia at the same time. Nord Stream 2, Germany obviously doesn't need to be lectured on the consequences of that. 
uh, reconfiguration of the political environment in Germany that coincided with the rejection of Nord Stream 2. All these things converge to make the conditions ripe for Russia to see the writing on the wall that whatever it wanted to obtain from Russia, from Ukraine was no longer going to be able to be produced through a uh, peaceful dialogue. And for whatever you may believe, I think Russia saw the opportunity for a preemptive invasion of Ukraine given that the likelihood of Ukraine being more favorable or predisposed to a political uh, solution was reducing and changing with time. So I, I like to think that we can put all this on Putin's doorstep, but I think that we, uh, reflecting on what has happened in the, over the course of the last six months since Biden was elected, uh, there has to be some responsibility uh, borne by uh, the West, in particular the United States, for getting us where we are. I don't think they thought through the sincerity and the importance of a, a constructive dialogue. Whether you agree or not, Minsk II had produced something, which is the absence of large-scale fighting. And that's significant. Whether you agree that a frozen conflict is the best future for Ukraine, it's far preferable than where we are now. Yeah, I think that's clear. Uh, my question was more specific, but maybe others could address it. But uh, let me put it into a future scenario. Let's assume that there is any kind of chance for any kind of agreement uh, to at least stop the war and any kind of political, let's call it settlement, I wouldn't even call it a peace solution, um, that might hold then for some time at least. Is it foreseeable that if there is any special status agreed upon for those territories that are currently under Russian occupation, like Krim or under Russian control, that this special status could um, involve any kind of um, veto power of these uh, special areas um, over what the Kiev central government might do or might not do in the future. This is my question, because we are, we are all asking ourselves, I mean, if you are of the position, as some of you might be, that Putin is going to the end and will not shy away from his, what he declares his maximum demands um, and that there is no chance whatsoever for any kind of settlement, then this question is answered. But if you do believe there must be some possibility, uh, I would put this question also uh, to the others too, especially to Tamar and Oksana, whether you find this possible. But let me, before you start, uh, Oksana, come with another question to you also. You described three very important reforms that have happened since 2014. My question is, um, has the Krim and has have the Donbas provinces been totally separated or isolated from these reforms? Or have there been any kind of contacts despite the difficult situation uh, to the people in the Krim uh, and also in Donbas uh, to have them to some degree at least um, implement similar reforms? even though if not as far reaching as in the rest of the country. Oksana. Uh, yes, thank you for your question. So uh, Krim and occupied areas of Donetsk and uh, Luhansk, they were completely uh, cut off uh, from these reforms because the reforms have been conducted under the Ukrainian state and obviously uh, these territories uh, were not under uh, Ukrainian influence. Uh, but uh, one interesting um, phenomenon I observed uh, in Donetsk region, because it's not all Donetsk region that has been uh, occupied, but a part of it. And uh, we've been studying, uh, my colleague uh, and I, uh, Alexandra Koidel, uh, for UNESCO, uh, the technologies that are used against corruption in the education sector. And we were studying, we saw um, implementation of open school technology in uh, Donetsk region uh, performing the best. Well, we figured out that uh, this um, closer, <laughs> close um, uh, conflict or close war area, it kind of had this mobilizing uh, effect on the people and on the civil society. Uh, for them to engage and to be uh, even more uh, active. And in addition, they were also experiencing a lot of support from the uh, international partners. Uh, so all this, we might kind of project also to the effect in the country, 
that uh, the uh, conflict or the invasion in 2014 uh, gave the kick to mobilize also uh, and to react. And also one of the interviews that I conducted on the uh, anti-corruption reform in the defense sector, when I was asking like, what made possible to open this highly vertical and closed uh, sector for a reform. And one of the answers was also this military threat and the war threat uh, from the side of Russia uh, that gave this uh, mobilization input and openness and uh, the kick to collaborate in a society. You want to address my first question also, whether you foresee any kind of negotiated settlement that gives the uh, those territories any special rights, even maybe a veto? Uh, maybe to go to your, to your previous question, yeah. why Minsk didn't work. And this is exactly the critique uh, I would like, uh, or I try to address with uh, my statement, because of the way of thinking that is not working anymore in today's world. And the way of thinking that is not working, I mean the thinking in these two blocks and in national, uh, national uh, borders. Like for me as a person in the 21st century that is working simultaneously in at least three countries, uh, I cannot comprehend the uh, argument that NATO's border is on the Ukraine and this is the alliance that is defending beyond this border while there is a real threat of nuclear catastrophe. I just cannot comprehend this physical border that is not there. It's just simply not there and the world change and we have to deal with this changing world. And I feel the, in, in the discussion and in the negotiations, we are still in this cold world logic that is not working anymore. And this is only one aspect that I highlighted uh, about the national borders. The another, another aspect is uh, the West is all the time trying to figure out the logic behind Putin's actions and the rationality behind them. Well, the invasion in, in 2014, I agree, we might interpret there some logic in it, some rationality, but with the full scale invasion we see now, uh, it just doesn't fit in the logic of the NATO that NATO came to the, uh, expanded to the East and now Putin is reacting because he is threatened. Uh, Putin shows very obviously that he believes in what he says in the propaganda and he wants to vanish Ukrainian statehood and Ukrainian identity from the earth. Why so ever? Is it crazy mind? Is it some imperialism? Whatsoever. But this is not the ratio that people in the NATO are trying to figure out. And the third point is, if we even go with the argument that Putin is uh, threatened by the expansion of NATO to the east, then I would like to point out that Russia expanded to the West in the econom economic warfare through strategic corruption well before the summit in 2008. And uh, cases like lobby by Schroeder, uh, cases like political finance for populist political parties, uh, money laundering by politically exposed persons, all the networks that have been created between the West according to the double standards and Russia, this is for me the sign that Russia expanded influence to the West well before NATO did at least some vague steps or I, this is another discussion. I believe these are not uh, even the steps because uh, you will have to be one, you, you need to be kind of, uh, the country has to be wanted to be in NATO, right? To express the will to be in NATO while uh, Russia is imposing the influence uh, to the countries. And this is just the uh, difference in the worldviews and uh, in the approaches that but let me, let uh, me, we have to account for. We will not, <laughs> that, probably not be able to uh, discuss this point, but to your second point, if you say that these are the goals of Putin, as you describe them, if that is the fact, do you see then any room for any kind of settlement? Not at costs of Ukraine. Okay, Tamara, your answer to this question, you have to open your mic. You agree <laughs> with uh, Oksana's um, analysis? 
Uh, I agree with Oksana, and I want to answer. There is one question directed to me, as I see, Please. and it's about uh, about uh, uh, female body as suffering during conflict. And the Victoria says that uh, now with uh, this visuality that is created in Ukraine for one month of war, there is difference. And I would say yes, actually. Even uh, I, I have studies on Euromaidan protests uh, and on bus war, and uh, from uh, this visuals, uh, visuality, you could see how really Ukraine was a symbol of suffering women, and Russia as like symbol of, uh, uh, you know, masculinity, violent masculinity, Putin, whatever. And it was much more on victimization and suffering. But now, as far as, as I said, women actively participate in resistance in different types. And uh, so you see that uh, uh, those who create these images, they react in a bit other way. In a more courage way, you see more militarized women together with militarized men as a symbol of resistance uh, but it's because actually for this last uh, from Yevromaidan protests uh, uh, society changed and uh, uh, women managed to uh, uh, to become more active also in uh, armed forces and in participation in military actions Okay, let me ask one last question to Sita before we turn to those uh, questions put forward in the chat. Sita, to my, to my reception, you were very, very diplomatic. So let me ask you a blunt question. As somebody from the Global South, would you argue that um, the sanctions, the economic sanctions Western countries handed down now against Russia, which have a lot of support in the West here, especially with those people who say we could not do anything militarily. But would you say they are wrong because they have so catastrophic consequences for many people in this house because of food prices exploding, there is no more wheat, neither from Ukraine and probably also not from Russia in the future? Or how would you, how would you discuss the sanctions? Mm -hmm. That's very interesting, and just I mean, uh, it's not about being diplomatic. It's it's being you know uh, having a different perspective where I don't believe in either or, where I whereas I believe in and. So you know, it's about uh, uh, doing things together rather than having being divided into this or that. You know, that's I think a very Western sort of understanding. Whereas I mean, if we really look at uh, alternatives, I think it's always about you know uh, taking everyone and everyone's concentrations in in uh, in mind. Having said that, when you're talking about sanction, I think it also depends on whose perspective are we talking about. And, okay. and I mean, <clears throat> exactly. I mean, and when we talk about people in the global south, I mean, the, the, the argument that we gave is that as much as, you know, uh, the West is trying to impose sanctions and everything, I mean, uh, is it not double standards that is being talked at here? So I think that that's something which, uh, a, Similar logic was also used in the Iraq war or others, but did we also do that at, at that particular point? So, so it's just about, uh, I mean, and, and a lot of the countries, I mean, none of them have said that what Russia has done is right, but they are also saying that, you know, uh, like, for example, I can talk about India. They say that, I mean, you know, we, we need oil, we, you know, India's third uh, uh, net import of oil. How are we going, where do we sort of, you know, how do we manage that? And, and if the population like that, uh, you know, and, and also when we look at, so that is mostly sort of, you know, in terms of our energy needs, but also in terms of uh, our own security as such. Uh, you know, uh, we've, we've had, uh, uh, you know, Russian sort of, you know, arms for quite some time, our soldiers have been trained in that. So when, if if China and then you had problematic sort of you know even even uh, very recently we've had these, these problems with, uh, with with China will West or will, will European countries come to stand and say okay we are going to do that no so it's it's about really I mean you know as much as, as I said that when we're talking about interests and principles 
somewhere i mean i guess it's, it's more about you know interest than and one has to look out for oneself okay so, you are a perfect diplomat i i stick to that <laughs> okay i turn over to um, it's either patricia or julia who is um, is monitoring the chat questions and please uh, read them out to us now but uh, Andrea, just to add, because you said I am a perfect victim, I think India has always had problems with sanctions. I mean, this entire notion of punishing and others, I think it's very problematic in principle. Okay. So, yeah, I think that might be a bit more clear idea, I guess. Julia. Great. Uh, first, thank you to the audience for all the questions. And thank you to David, who is uh, very diligently answering them <laughs> already through the Q&A function in the background before I can even post them to the rest of the panel. Um, and, uh, and also to Tamara for answering the question about uh, the role and the vision on women's bodies. So I think that has been answered. Um, but one question that is, I think, um, not only occupying Nina's mind is uh, what we can do apart from helping uh, Ukrainian refugees here uh, to contribute to peace and what also what can what can individuals do what can research centers do um, and that is probably also connected to the question by Masha who uh, asks what we can do in order to put pressure on our own governments to focus on possible aspects of de-escalation and to include appropriate peace researchers and professionals. This is being addressed to Oksama and Tamara? I think it's generally to, to the whole panel. Okay, who wants to go first? Try that second okay. question, Tamara, if you don't let's, mind. Let's say women first, Tamara and then David. Tamara. Sure. Oh, yeah, thanks a lot. I saw it was question what academic community and real scholars could do. And I personally, as um, I see, I think that but uh, when we take ever studies like Russian Eastern European studies, and we could see that at least in Europe, there is much more stress on Russia. And very often it seems like the results on research in Russia is extrapolated to other societies like uh, Ukraine. And I think uh, what I would like, it's more development of Ukrainian studies in Germany, in other European countries. It's rather, it's better developed in US and Canada, actually, but still uh, a support of uh, academic uh, publications uh, uh, to support scholars who couldn't, uh, who couldn't evacuate like me uh, because they have different circumstances and they can't be on campuses of uh, uh, German and other universities. So thank you. Thank you, David. On the question of how um, populations and citizens can bring some pressure to bear on their on their elected leaders, I mean, this is the this is the most important question because there was a question raised in the Q and A regarding the importance of democracy, and that if if we carry through the logic that the American administration is trying to press upon the world that this is an alliance of democracies against all other states, the key. To, defining characteristic between these two blocks, if you will, is that under a democracy, we have accountability and transparency, and we have openness. And yet we see none of this at play in regards to the kinds of political options and strategies our leaders are pursuing. I, I reiterate what I said earlier, what is the America's, what is the American end game or strategic outcome that they wish to see have happen in this particular crisis. They're being tight-lipped and uh, obviously unwilling to engage in a public dialogue as to how this will impact their people as well as the, the global economy, as well as the global political and social environment. We need, this is the one defining characteristic that, that we have available to us as individuals who reside within democracies, asking our governments, what is it they expect to achieve from this conflict? And how do they expect to achieve this, this outcome with, without engendering costs that are so consequential that they themselves will be ousted from power? No one seems to be questioning the motivation or end game or goals of our elected leaders, because they themselves don't know what those end goals are, or at least the Americans are staying very tight lipped about it. But now that we see the prospect of nuclear war being raised, in fact, there are Americans who have openly espoused this as an option. 
one has to then call call into question whether these leaders do in fact, fact think themselves accountable. So there is that side of the equation. This is the key defining, if it isn't truly a battleground between democracies and the rest, then let's prove that by holding our elected leaders accountable. But the other key facet to this conflict is that the frontline states in which Germany is a particular uh, party to this process are being deeply affected in a way I think the, the promulgators of this conflict do not comprehend or care about. You know, in the UK, they say people can buy potatoes, but they can't afford to buy the gas to cook them. We know now that there's going to be a massive food shortage throughout the Western Sahel and into the Maghreb and upon countries that are already facing huge famine. If we don't feel obligated to ask, this isn't about the Russian war, this is about the sanctions that are being imposed on Russia, which carry huge impacts for people who are not directly participants in this conflict. So I think it's incumbent upon us to begin asking these questions, but how much longer can that be sustained before these economies themselves are compromising the entitlements of the population that they are responsible for? I would ask people living in Germany, what, are, what is the situation there? How much more can you sustain before inflation hits such a, a level that the people there are facing dire consequences? I we haven't reached, yeah. yeah. I, so I, I think there's, there's going to be something that's going to evolve out of this, whether it's positive or negative. One has to begin pressuring our governments to behave in a responsible way. If you see that as appeasement or concessions, Okay. Towards Russia, I don't. I don't really know what the uh, alternative would be. I think the point was was pretty clear, and I mean, you addressed exactly the question I earlier asked to hit at. And if I'm as a German, might make this one comment: between the uh, prospect people in the global south have the hunger situation, uh, and uh, people in which Germany might face if gas prices shoot up, I think there is still a huge difference. But let's come to Oksana. Any answer to the question, the original one from the chat? What yes, I will be glad uh, to answer, uh, to follow up on Tamara's question, uh, because she raised uh, the point that it would be good to study more Ukraine, not only Russia. And I would like to say why, because this is really important. This is again changing mine, uh, and I cannot help it to uh, say that uh, in the perspective on the war, for me, constructivist logic is missing very much. So we have uh, realism, we have liberalism, but uh, the constructivism in international relations is like nowhere there. And this is exactly the point. Looking into the country, what does it mean also Ukraine? Because Ukraine is barely there also in the discussion, for example, that you were having with David about uh, mediation and solutions. This is only Russia and only West, like there is no word about Ukraine, right? And this is exactly the point, the constructivist point to open this black box. And this goes to the question also uh, of Hartwig about democracy, because I think this is exactly the value of democracy, that people can decide something on their own and we can apply it also in international relations. Why are we ignoring this principle in international relations, a taking the voice from Ukraine to decide on its own. And what Ukraine needs is weapons to protect themselves. If NATO, if NATO is not coming, then at least support to protect themselves. And why it's important, why is there? I see there are a couple of questions. There might be an option to leave Donbas uh, or Crimea to Russia. This is not an option. And I'll tell you why, because this is not the goal of Putin to keep uh, Donbas or Crimea. Well, he wants to wipe out Ukraine from the face of earth and to undermine democratic values and uh, European values. And not only values, I don't know, is it uh, an option or not to go further to the east? But anyway, uh, this is clear and Mariupol is showing to us that if Ukraine will surrender a piece of the territory, then people will be prosecuted, they will be sent to Russia, uh, or like in the Second World War to some gulag, uh, they will be wiped out from the earth. And this is just not an option for Ukraine because either the army protects now the country or then Russians will kill them. Okay, and I, there is I, nothing I, rational about it. Uh, that's very clear now your position, but let me just ask you the consequence might be 
that this war might go on for quite a long time, always in the hope that the Ukrainian forces might uh, win it. But during this time, there will be many, 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 many more victims. Even, uh, even if we will remain in this elite thinking, right? And uh, even if a thought experiment, we go and think of a possible um, freedom, possible, um, I don't know, frozening the conflict, if you wish. Uh, Ukraine is not anymore the same as it was used to be 2014. And there will be huge resistance with Zelensky or without Zelensky, with government or without government. And this will go into the bloody guerrilla war that will not uh, finish soon. So okay. either way, I don't see the possibility for freezing or compromising uh, Ukrainian territories in this conflict. Very clear position. Julia and Patricia, do we have time for some more from the chat or do we have to close? You decide. I would probably, if that is okay with everybody, um, suggest to um, ask Cornelia for her comments. But if there are any, um, any important questions that the panelists would still um, I feel urged to answer, then obviously I don't want to prevent you from that. But otherwise that would be my suggestion. Thank you. Okay, that seems to be agreed, Cornelia. Okay, so maybe I'm starting a new round of discussions now with my comments because First of all, thank you very much to all of you. Um, I think it was very and very informative and very, very important to have the different views um, because I think in Germany we're, we're somehow stuck or in Europe we're somehow stuck with our perspective. Um, and therefore it was very, very important to listen to um, Tamara and Oksana um, also to hear David's comment from, from the transatlantic view and also to listen to Siddharth. And, and although he was quite diplomatic as, as Andreas Zuma said before, um, I was wondering, uh, at the beginning I thought, okay, we, we have some common ground because uh, as David started with his, uh, uh, with his observation that the intrusion of heavy weapons is hampering a lasting peace, I thought, okay, maybe we can get on some common ground re regarding um, um, uh, the, 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 the weapons issue, uh, regarding the military buildup in, in, in Ukraine. Um, at the same time, David ended with Russia has to be driven out properly for a feasible solution. If I understood you correctly, that, that's not true. I, I, I didn't say it. what I said was I think that's the perception of the West, and that is their end goal. Okay, the, thank the, you. The, 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 the okay. alternative is far worse. The, the alternative is, in fact, the collapse of Russia, which right. I think is also yeah. I think that's also in the U.S. end game, which is catastrophic for the world. That's you it. know okay. Russia's collapse is not a public good. Okay. okay. Okay, thank yeah. you for this clarification. So sure. um, Oksana and also Tamara, they pointed out that um, you underestimated us in the Ukraine. Um, you didn't really pay attention to what happened in the Ukraine from 2014 onwards, since um, the occupation of the Crimea, uh, with the reforms, with the um, uh, process of democratization and transformation of Ukraine. And this is why we witnessed this kind of resistance now, because at the beginning, I think a lot of even, even Western military observers, they thought that Kiev would fall within a week or so, and this didn't happen. And I think this is quite interesting for us to, to look, have a closer look at what happened in, in Ukraine during the last eight years. Um, but what does this mean for us? Um, <laughs> As, as Oksana pointed out, or your, your, last your last conversation with Andreas was, uh, okay, this will be an almost endless guerrilla warfare, even if, if uh, Ukraine will be occupied by Russia, it will be another, as some Western observer already uh, pointed out, another Afghanistan for Russia. Uh, when they when they try to in, uh, really, really invade or, or take, take Ukraine. 
Um, but at the same time, um, we know that fighting will not lose, uh, will not, will not, will not end. Or, or, by fighting, this conflict cannot be will not will not be decided. So we have at some point we have to go back to dialogue and some kind of mediation, as David pointed out. But still, we do not know who might be a mediator or what kind of avenue might be interesting. Sidat pointed, pointed to the non-alignment movement. So this, this question of a neutral status of Ukraine, would this be feasible? And what I all, also take with me uh, during our discussion is that we, we, still, we are still think, thinking in terms of um, two blocks, two or many blocks, and great power powers who have spheres of influence. Um, this this uh, uh, David pointed to to the end game or, or what is the American end game question mark and the position of Russia. Do we want Russia to fall? Uh, do we want a regime change in Russia? Would this be something we? Although people are talking about. Oh, if only Putin would be gone, then we would have peace. I don't think this would be the case. Um, so I think we're still back at square one. So um, how can we solve this conflict peacefully? By mediation, by making concessions, by thinking about what status could Ukraine have, also from a global perspective. Um, and this is something I would think states like India should join the conversation. I do know this is not your problem. This is, this is a, a European problem. But still, countries like India, they do have a tradition. They do have some ideas or might have some visions of a new world order. Because China isn't, couldn't be that kind of broker that India hopefully might be, or any other country might be. So I think we should also think about how can a dialogue start about ending this conflict peacefully? Because as we were talking now, military buildup, endless fighting, nobody would win in the end. So, but Oksana, <laughs> I will give the last word to you. You <laughs> raised your hand. I would like to second what you said. Uh, well, my position was not against the dialogue or mediation, but it was against the dialogue where Ukraine is excluded and there is only NATO and Russia having the discussion and someone is mediating. So this is not the solution. Instead, we have to embrace a new reality that the world is much more complex and think in networks and not in blocks and in much more flexible networks than two blocks or whatsoever. And exactly what you said, that engaging other countries who are directly affected by this conflict, by this war is really crucial. And the uh, assembly of UN, UN and the resolution by uh, uh, two thirds of the members, it shows that this is possible. And that would be a very different pressure on Russia than uh, only having a possible uh, dialogue of two without Ukraine and just uh, deciding something upon others. Thank you very much for making this even clearer than I could could try to make it. So I think um, although it's a it's a war in Europe, I think we should talk about a future world order and a future European security order. Um, and not just listen to what America, the US, American endgame, what the US might come up in the end. Sure, European Union, NATO members, um, and G7, G7 members are, are talking today in Brussels. But it's about the Ukraine. It's about a new world order. It's about other countries being affected, affected by this conflict, by this war in Europe now. And I think we should also ask other countries to join us at the negotiation table and come up with ideas how to solve this conflict. Okay, I I I feel very much um, tempted yet to continue the discussion for another hour. I would react to Osama and would challenge that a little bit. 
given the very fact that the Ukrainian president, like never before in the history I can remember, has managed in the last four weeks to really climb the stage of the world and 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 bring the Ukrainian uh, message uh, to every nearly every NATO parliament to other parliaments. So, uh, and if you see how the Ukrainian uh, ambassador in Berlin. Uh, is since weeks influencing the debate. Um, I think mm. we are beyond, we are de facto long beyond the situation that uh, NATO and Russia are negotiating over the head um, of Ukraine. The, the, the big issue is, is that what some Ukrainians and the government are demanding or expecting or hoping from NATO to do is something NATO countries still are hesitating from, uh, uh, the air zone, etc. But I think this is for another debate. I think we have to. I, I mean, I don't know. You are the masters of ceremony here. The, the word was till six o'clock. Uh, I'm open, but uh, I don't know how you how you handle that. Yes, um, thank you very much. Maybe uh, we will call it, um, well, in a day. Um, um, we could go on for hours and hours, and obviously, I mean, maybe that's what we should do, should do, have another discussion. But for now, um, yeah, I would like to thank you all very much, um, to our moderator, um, to our panelists, and uh, Cornelia for, our, uh, for, your, for your comments. Um, I found this incredibly helpful and enlightening, and, and I hope we all stay in touch and continue these discussions and again special thanks uh, to Tamara and Oksana that um, yeah you joined us here it's, it's particularly difficult for you and um, thank you just yeah thank you so much okay thank you.